thank you very much for coming to listen to, to this talk. This is not going to be a very technical talk, but there will be some code at the end. And uh, it's going to last for about 35 minutes or so. So there will be time for some questions at the end, or, or then we could just have a longer break until the next talk. Uh, this is the story about how I learned uh, domain-driven design. Uh, it's not an introduction to domain-driven design, so you will be needing some basic understanding of the DDD concepts. Uh, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself, then we're going to take, uh, uh, take you on this uh, DDD journey of mine, and then at the end I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about my current thoughts and, and uh, lessons learned and the main points that I, I want to make with this talk. So, who am I? I'm a principal software engineer at Vardin in Finland. And, uh, well, I'm actually talking to you from my sauna, as one does. I'm 39 years old. I began programming with QBasic on an old 386 running MS-DOS 6.22 and Windows 3.11, if I remember correctly, uh, when I was around 10 or 11. And uh, a few years later, in my early teens, I built my first database applications with Borland Delphi and uh, the Paradox database engine. And around the millennium shift, I started to look at web apps uh, with the LAMP, uh, so PHP, MySQL, Apache, and Linux. And in 2003, I learned Java, and I immediately wanted to jump uh, to uh, Java 2 EE 1.4 because that's was where the big guys were using, right? So I got this book, a Learning J2 EE 1.4, and I was quite disappointed because it was so complex and so bloated. Fortunately, I ran into another book, which was called Better, Faster, Lighter Java, and that introduced me to Spring and Hibernate, which were really, really new and fresh at the time. And I got hooked immediately and started to write applications using Spring and Hibernate. Uh, when Java EE6 came out, I actually briefly jumped back to Java EE because at the time I felt that Spring has become a bit too bloated. But that changed when Spring Boot was introduced and, well, I've been a Springy ever since. And even though these two books are practically useless today, I still have them in my bookshelf as a reminder of where I'm coming from. I joined Vardin, uh, my current company, uh, fresh out of university back in 2009. I have had various roles and positions over the years, but I've always been working uh, directly with customers, uh, at least most of the time. So either as a consultant, helping them with their own projects, or then I've been involved in delivering projects uh, where we were like the, the main responsible vendor. I was also the first uh, appointed architect at Vardin. Uh, not because I was particularly experienced at the time, but uh, we didn't have an architect at the time and uh, we needed to grow this capability in case we would need it in the future. And I was interested, so I got it. And well, since I didn't have any senior colleagues to coach me, I had to learn everything by myself. And uh, that's uh, what we're going to be talking about next because the ride was far from smooth. So let's jump to today's topic, uh, 10 plus years with DDD. My first contact with DDD happened uh, a few years into my professional career. And uh, I was brought into an ongoing project that had serious data integrity issues. And uh, my task was to, to try to fix these issues in some way to save the project. And I really, really wanted to prove myself and learn from other people's mistakes rather than make my own. The problem with this project was that it has started out as a graph database project. And uh, then in the middle, uh, they had changed to a relational database. Uh, so they threw out the graph API and introduced Eclipse Link and JPA instead. Nodes and edges, they will turn into tables and columns. And uh, of course, there were no transactions. So uh, the application was having optimistic logging errors everywhere. We had duplicates in the database because of incorrect cascading updates. Uh, the application also didn't have any like frameworks such as Spring or EGB, and I actually never understood why. And uh, I started to do some research 
to find something useful that we could use to turn this project around. And that's when I stumbled upon the so-called Blue Book or Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. Now, I learned tactical design first because strategic design is covered in the second half of the book. And of course, I stopped reading as soon as I thought I had found what I needed. So uh, tactical DDD were uh, these uh, building blocks, as a recap here, uh, that you use when you actually design your domain models and write the code. So that would be the entities, the value objects, aggregates, repositories, and domain services. And uh, armed with this new knowledge, uh, we started refactoring this data model into something that looked a little bit more like a domain model. So we introduced repositories, we introduced entities, uh, we introduced aggregates, aggregate routes. Uh, we might have had some value object in there as well, but the emphasis was on, on the entity part. Uh, the business logic was still mostly left in various types of services, even though some of it was probably added to to uh, the domain model as well. And we also added Spring to get transaction management. And this worked. It fixed all the integrity issues. And on the downside, the aggregates became way too big and too slow. But that wasn't a problem. We just saved some part of them as JSON or XML, stored them in a blob column, and that was it. Application went to production. I actually don't know what happened to it. But anyway, uh, DDD has become uh, my new golden hammer at this point. And of course, I really want to, to try it out in my next Greenfield project, in which I was supposed to be the architect. And now, since we had read the first half of the blue book, we wanted to put the ubiquitous language to good use, because that's what you do in DDD projects. And a general principle that we adopted was that if we can't discuss or reason about a concept, then something is missing from our model and we have to go look for it. And this uh, principle turned out to be really nice. We had some really nice brainstorming sessions together with the UX designer. And uh, this helped us to, to go looking for solutions outside the box when we had a complex problem. So uh, the start uh, was pretty good. The project uh, were actually wasn't actually a single application, but more of a suite of applications, suite of applications, but we didn't realize that at the time. So uh, what we ended up with was one monolith uh, with a one large domain model, one database, one deployment unit. And uh, well, bounded contexts would have been really nice, but you know, I didn't know about them because I had stopped reading after the first half of the blue book. So uh, before you know it, things start to go wrong and application services are growing, the application is growing. We're starting to see code duplications in different services because you couldn't really tell which service to put the code in because all the alternatives were equally good or equally bad. Um, to, to make it worse, we actually had to make the application go into production before it was finished. And uh, it was suffering from poor performance. It had lots of bugs. Uh, we had based our designs on assumptions that turned out to be incorrect. And the project required a massive effort, but eventually it was successful, well, at least for, for, for everyone else but me, because I had to leave the project in the middle for mental health reasons. So the golden hammer, well, it wasn't so golden after all. But what do you do when you fall? You get up, second attempt new Greenfield project. Uh, I want to prove myself again. I don't want to repeat the mistakes from a previous project. I'm again supposed to be the architect and we have a completely different type of application with new challenges. And biggest challenge in this one is that we have a completely new database that we have never even heard of before. Um, it's a hybrid document graph database and we still or I still want to somehow use DDD here. So of course that means entities, aggregates and repositories. So I decide that hmm, uh, maybe I could store the aggregates in documents and then I could use these graph capabilities for the relationships between the different aggregate routes. And based on these assumptions, uh, we started to design and build the application. 
And of course, things started to go wrong for the second time. Because the data model in this case was actually quite anemic. Uh, the application was a data aggregation application. It was collecting data from various sources, combining it, and then presenting it in a consistent manner. There wasn't really any business logic. There wasn't any editing. What we had was large amount of data, and an important requirement was query performance, which we didn't have with my DDD inspired model because this project, well, it wasn't a good match for DDD at all. What I should have done instead is to first learn the new database properly. And then I should have created a data model that was optimized for query performance. But I didn't realize this at the time because I really wanted to use DDD. So I had now been involved in two projects where things went bad because I had tried to apply tactical DDD and failed. I was actually diagnosed with depression. I had to leave the project and my colleagues had to pick up the pieces again. I had a serious case of the imposter syndrome and I decided that I'm gonna take off my architect's hat for a while. I just wanna code now. I don't want to make any design decisions. I don't want to design architectures. I just want to implement whatever somebody else uh, tells me to. But I hadn't lost faith in DDD. I, I still thought that there has to be something there. You know, uh, when you're making your ubiquitous language, if there's something missing, uh, you can tell because it's difficult to, to reason about it. And in this case, I thought that maybe there's some, some piece missing from, from my DDD ubiquitous language that I haven't found yet. So I went looking. And that's when I stumbled upon the Red Book, uh, Implementing Domain Driven Design by Juan Vernon. Now, there is a, a big difference between the Red Book and the Blue Book. Now, Vernon, in his Red Book, he actually begins the book with the strategic design or subdomains and bounded contexts. Whereas Evans finishes his book with them, and that's, well, why I missed them. So finally, uh, boundaries were added to my DDD ubiquitous language. You see, the problem was that I was still stuck in this uh, normalized relational database way of thinking that I had learned in the university, where everything is stored in one place only and then referenced from all the other places. And you have to have this one big model of everything, one source of truth. And now all of a sudden you didn't have to do this anymore. Instead, you could have small models uh, with clearly defined boundaries. And what's best, better, uh, these models actually didn't have to be aware of each other. We could create dedicated integration points uh, or context maps that would translate from one model to another. And boundaries is something that's uh, really important, to, especially to me, but also to all other uh, programmers, because uh, I know many programmers, myself included, that are suffering from scope creep. For instance, I never finish any of my hobby projects because they keep growing and growing and growing until it's not fun anymore. And then I just start over and history repeats itself. So learning how to set proper boundaries should be one of the first things that we teach to new programmers. And I don't think it was even mentioned during my five years uh, studying at, to become a software engineer. So bounded contexts is a good idea, even if you're not doing DDD. And microservices today is a great example of this. Uh, essentially, a microservice is a bounded context. Uh, another thing that I learned from Vernon's Red Book uh, was the hexagonal architecture. Because prior to this, I had been mostly working with layered architectures where you had this database access layer at the bottom, and then you had entities, and then you had services with the business logic, and then you had a UI on top. And then there were rules about which layers could communicate with which layers. And now the hexagonal architecture expands on this. So a quick recap, uh, we have the domain model in the middle, application services around, and then we have a uh, uh, a driven side that contains a driven port uh, from which the application can call out to the outside world. And then we have a driving side with driving ports or APIs uh, 
that allows the outside world to call into the application. And then we have adapters that are either calling these ports or implementing them, depending on whether they are APIs or SPIs. Um, I really like this new architecture, but I got it wrong at first because I was still stuck in this mindset that a port, hmm, that's probably like a network port, like the traffic goes through. So I got the order of the ports and adapters wrong. So I thought that, that uh, the outside world would go through a port and then uh, hit an adapter and then the adapter would talk with the application and not the other way around. Uh, what's worse, I even wrote blog posts about this and taught my colleagues about this using the wrong model. And eventually, a reader of my blog pointed to Alistair Coburn's article and said that, hey, you, you actually got the order of these, these concepts wrong. And then when I read the architect or, uh, this uh, article, uh, I finally got it. And it actually made more sense to me. And then I corrected my blog posts. And well, now the hexagonal architecture is my go-to architecture in all of my projects because it's so versatile. Uh, version uh, also introduced the concept of a domain event. And why are domain events important? The thing is, I've noticed that we have a tendency to look at the static structure of things a lot. We have class diagrams, we have component diagrams, we have package diagrams. And if you think about architecture diagrams, well, they are boxes with lines and arrows. It's structure, structure, structure. And of course, structure is important, but it's only one part of the story. Dynamics is just as important, if not more. Uh, for instance, if you were to, to take an unknown system, you don't know what it does. Uh, chances are you will learn more about it by observing it during runtime than just looking at the, the static structure of it. And what domain events do is that they introduce dynamics into our domain models. And this is an important step to get past the CRUD way of thinking, where CRUD is create, retrieve, update, delete. So the problems that I have with CRUD is that it puts the business logic into the heads of the users. Because uh, CRUD is only about creating and uh, retrieving, updating data. It says nothing about why you are creating the data or what caused you to update the data or what happens after you delete the data. All that is inside the heads of the users. And uh, well, domain models, they are an abstraction of the real world. And in the real world, things happen all the time. And uh, what we have to do is then deal with these events. And well, the domain model, it's an abstraction of the real world. So it should have something as well here. And we should have to be able to deal with these events in our domain model as well. And uh, what is it? that uh, helps us deal with these events? Well, that's the business logic. I stumbled upon something called event storming by mistake. And it immediately made sense to me uh, because instead of looking at things and relationships, which is what I was used to doing, I, you start by looking at the events. So you look at what are all the things that can happen inside this business process or inside this problem domain. And then you start to build the story around them. And then after you have identified the events and how they were triggered or when they were triggered and by whom they were triggered or why they were triggered or what happens after they are triggered, finally you add the aggregates and the relationships. So you're basically turning the process around. And if it's, this is the first time you're hearing about event storming, I encourage you to look it up. It's really useful. It's a team method. Um, you use differently colored post-it notes for each event or each command or each actor and so on. And then you put them on a wall in chronological order uh, where time moves from left to right. And uh, you can move these post-its around as you want, and you can throw old ones on the floor. You can write new ones, put them up as you discuss and talk and gain insight and so on. And uh, I really wanted to try out this new shiny thing. And uh, well, long story short, eventually there was a new Greenfield project. This was my third attempt to apply DDD. And this time I really wanted to get it right. <laughs> 
So, a colleague of mine and I, we were going to prepare for this. This project was going to include our own developers, the customer's developers and the customer's product owners. And it was really important that we would get everybody on the same page and pulling in the same direction and speaking the same language. So we would have the same domain terminology uh, for everything. And we decided, let's try out event storming just for fun. It will only take like an hour or so because it's time boxed and see what happens. I mean, uh, what, the, what is there to lose? So that's what we did. So we got our Sharpies. Uh, we got our post-it notes. Uh, we got a room with lots of empty wall space and we put all the people in there. And we gave them a short introduction that this is what we're going to do. This is what the different colors mean. This is how you do it. And let's get to work. And it was actually quite fun. Uh, some people immediately got the idea. They started scribbling words on these uh, post-it notes, putting them up on the wall, moving them around, throwing them on the floor and so on. Uh, for others, it took a little longer, but eventually everybody uh, got a hang of it, what the idea was. And eventually everybody was actively participating and talking to each other. And this one hour or whatever it was, it flew past really quickly. And at the end, we had lots and lots of discarded post-it notes on the floor, which is an indication of progress. And we had lots of uh, post-it notes on the wall as well. And uh, we took pictures of this uh, in case we would need them uh, when we actually started to design the user interface and the domain models. But we actually ended up uh, not using these photos because the insights that we gained during the process of event storming itself that was what the true deliverables are in this case. So sometimes the journey is more important than the destination. All right, so after the event storming, we got started. And uh, like I already mentioned, I really wanted to get this right. And I really wanted to stay with this project until the very end and not having to drop out for some mental health reasons in the beginning, in, in the middle of it. We had a tight schedule. So there was no room for experimentation or any proof of concepts. Uh, we had to find the proper balance between tried and tested or boring technologies and new and unknown or exciting technologies. Uh, fortunately, we had a bounded context in mind from day one. So we started out with the hexagonal architecture. We went for our usual suspects, which is Spring Boot, Spring Data, JPA, SQL Server, and Vadim Flow. And we also went for a modular monolith because we thought that this would be the fastest alternative and it would save us time. And this turned out to be a mistake. So uh, then the pandemic hit us. And because of the nature of the customer and the nature of the project, it grew dramatically. And pretty soon it became clear that the monolithic architecture is not going to work. And we came up with several different alternatives to fix it, but our first attempts actually made it worse. So I was thinking, is this now the third time I'm screwing things up? And fortunately, this time it wasn't because now we had proper bounded contexts. And we turned the monolithic architecture into a microservice inspired architecture. So not really a true microservice architecture where we had each bounded context uh, deployed as a standalone Spring Boot application with its own Avadin user interface. And this meant that the applications could be independently deployed and independently evolved. And as the project was progressing, more and more and more applications were added to the mix. And this would never have been possible with the old monolithic architecture. So finally, I had a successful project with DDD thanks to strategic DDD or the bounded contexts that I didn't even know about because I stopped reading in the middle of Eric Aaron's book. The project lasted for three and a half years. I never had to drop out and it's the most successful one 
in my career so far. Uh, I've already talked about two uh, influential books, uh, the Red Book and the Blue Book, and now I want to introduce you to the Green Book, which is this one, Secure by Design by Dan and the Daniels. And uh, this was uh, quite a different reading experience compared to the first two ones, because when I was reading the first two ones, uh, I was introduced to new things. I had to learn new stuff all the time and try to figure out how to apply them. This green book uh, confirmed what I already knew and expanded on it. So I ended up reading it cover to cover while agreeing enthusiastically with more or less everything. It was probably the first book where I was like, running through the pages and saying yes 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 this is exactly this is like yes yes this is what yes exactly this and that's uh, an encouraging experience uh, the book contains a lot of really useful things so i highly recommend this uh, regardless of whether you're using ddd or not you should definitely read this book uh, and it also introduced the final missing piece of my own DDD ubiquitous language, which is domain primitives. Uh, I had for, for quite some time sensed the presence of the domain primitives, but I hadn't really found a suitable name. You know, li like an unknown planet, you know, it's there somewhere based on the movements of all the other celestial bodies, but you haven't discovered it just yet. And uh, when I, I was introduced to this concept, it immediately made perfect sense. So basically, uh, a domain primitive, it's a value object, and it's uh, meant to be used throughout your application, inside your bounded context, can even be used outside the bounded context, if it makes sense, instead of, of uh, normal primitives. So instead of having a string for, for your email address, you create an email address value object, for instance. And uh, the thing with this value object is that it has built-in validation. So just the fact that the email address object exists means that it contains a valid email address. And if you need to support storing, for instance, invalid email addresses in your application, you would end up with two domain primitives. One would be like a valid email address and the other one would be invalid email address. And then you can apply this way of thinking to everything else, phone numbers, names, birth dates, uh, whatever, IP addresses and so on. Uh, speaking of this, I've started to think about uh, our current best practices when it comes to implementing uh, good, well-written domain-driven uh, domain models. And whether our frameworks, best practices and APIs are actually suitable for DDD. Uh, now, there are, of course, uh, things in DDD, especially the strategic part, like the ubiquitous language and the bounded context. Those you can apply regardless of uh, what uh, framework or API or, or library that you're using. But what about the tactical stuff? What about our entities, value objects, aggregates, repositories? I would say that many of our current best practices and frameworks are actually taking us away from DDD rather than towards it. And I'm going to show you this uh, with an example, which is again one of my pet peeves. I, I have to warn you, I will exaggerate this a bit. I do realize that the world isn't as black and white as I will make it up to be in this next example, but I, hopefully you will get my point. And of course, I also realized that not all projects need DDD. But uh, anyway, here it is. So let's start with the standard Java Bean, following the Java Bean uh, specification. So first of all, this object is mutable, which means that it is not inherently thread safe. It also requires a default constructor. So once we instantiate this object person, uh, it will be completely empty. So all the first name, last name, phone number, all the other fields, they will be null. And then we have to use getters to get the data and setters to, read, uh, to, to write to it. And at some place, we might even have a user interface form uh, that is bound directly to this, this bean so that the first name property is bound to a, a first name input field in the UI. Right. 
So now, of course, we need to validate this bean because otherwise we can store anything in any field. So how do we do this the Java way? Well, we add validation annotations to it. So we specify here that the first name and last name, they are required, so they can't be blank. And the phone number and email, well, they need to contain a phone number and email. So what do we do? Well, we add the annotations for that and maybe create custom, custom validators. Same thing with bank account. And the birth date can't be in the future, so we add this past annotation to it. And then we run everything to a validator, which will give us a, a list of violations that we can do something about if we remember to do it. Next, you want to save this bean in the database. What do we do with the Java way? Well, we add JPA annotations. So now we're coupling uh, our person Java bean to a relational database schema. And uh, we have more restrictions. Uh, we can no longer mark the class as final. We can't mark any of the fields as final. Uh, we still are required to have a default constructor, even though it doesn't have to be public. We have to remember the length of our fields, in this case, 255 characters. Otherwise, we will end up with an error if we try to persist the first name that has 256 characters. But we won't know this until during runtime. And then if we can create a Spring Data repository or we interact with the Entity Manager directly to, to load and, and uh, save uh, new people objects. Finally, we want to make this Java bean available for other applications, such as a user interface, or in the case of, of Vadin, you could inject the repository straight into your user interface class and, and talk with it there. We may want to expose it as a REST resource, so we can do post, put, get, delete, or in this case, create, retrieve, update, delete, or CRUD. And we're done, right? This works. There are several applications built on these principles that get the job done, but they are also not particularly domain driven. We didn't create any domain primitives for the email address, for the phone number, for the bank account number, or even the birth date, or why not even the names that would have a built-in validation so that we know that they don't exceed the maximum length and they are of correct uh, format just because they exist. We don't create an initializing constructor that ensures that we can't create a new person object without passing in the minimum required information. We don't build our repositories in such a way that this bean itself doesn't need to know that it is actually being persisted into a relational database. And we don't necessarily even refer to this bean as an aggregate or an entity, even though that's exactly what it is. And we have completely forgotten about the domain operators operations because we have CRUD and that's enough, right? because that's what, what applications is about, showing uh, and storing data in some nice form and uh, maybe a grid somewhere. Uh, I would argue that if you were to take a more domain-driven approach here, uh, we would end up with the code that is uh, way more robust. It's easier to read, but also much more lengthy. So that means that if you want to do DDD the proper way, uh, we actually have to write more code. And because these annotations that we have, they are in there, they exist so that we can um, write less code. So there's a bit of a trade-off here between the current best practices and APIs and the domain-driven approach. And to me, it would be quite nice if, if, if there was like a better way of doing domain-driven applications uh, while also relying on our best practices and APIs and so on. Uh, we're reaching the end of my talk. Um, the final points, a few things that I hope that you will take away from this talk. Uh, first one is uh, don't give up. There is a saying in Swedish which says uh, we, are all, we all start out as children. So uh, if you don't succeed as first, uh, learn from it. Get back up and try again. Uh, I told you in the beginning that it was nice to learn from other people's mistakes. Uh, 
But I would definitely not be where I am today without all my own screw-ups, uh, even though they hurt quite a lot. And completely quitting, well, what would that be? That would be equal to flushing valuable and hard-earned knowledge away, because experience is something you get just after you need it. Second point is that it's not an all or nothing thing. Uh, you don't have to go all in to be able to benefit from something. Uh, Domain-driven design is a collection of things, and by themselves they are useful. So, for instance, the idea of the ubiquitous language, it works in all software projects, regardless of, of whether you're using the other DDD parts or not. And bounded contexts, well, they have proven their worth in microservice applications all around the world. And many of these microservice applications, well, they are driven by domain events. And I would argue that domain primitives will make your code more robust, secure, and easier to read, regardless of whether you're using aggregates, entities, or repositories. The third uh, takeaway is to challenge the best practices. You have to think about what the world looked like when these best practices were introduced, when the APIs were introduced. And chances are the world has changed quite a lot since then. And shouldn't we then change our APIs and best practices as well? So what worked yesterday may no longer be the best we can do today. And I've come to the conclusion that I, I've read somewhere that uh, annotations and frameworks are good, but you should keep them at an arm's distance. And uh, this is something that I've started to embrace myself in my own projects, uh, because I don't want frameworks to prevent me from writing good code such as, uh, for instance, JPA. Uh, if you want to build something a little bit more complex with JPA, um, you can't do everything you would like to do because of the restrictions of the relational database. And finally, you are not an imposter. Uh, I mentioned the imposter syndrome after several failures, and I know that there are plenty of us in the software business that have suffered from this from time to time. Just have a look at, at blogs uh, on the internet and, and you will you will notice this but uh, to you and me i want to tell the following uh, just the fact that we feel like imposters means that we know more than we realize because the more you learn the less you know which means that the more you learn the more you know that you don't know and in the beginning i made a lot of mistakes because i didn't know what i didn't know which was the bounded context and all the other strategic things. And the more I learned, the less confident I became because I realized how many things I had gotten wrong and how many things I didn't understand yet. But eventually, finally, the results proved that maybe I know something after all. And I'm still learning. And the green book uh, was maybe the, the final proof of this. When you have a book written by established authors, you open it, and you realize that they are telling you to do something you are already doing. That's a huge ego boost. So my DDD hammer, it's no longer golden, but I still keep it in my tool bed at all times. And sometimes I take it out for a little bit of polishing because just because it isn't golden, it doesn't mean it can't shine. Thank you very much. And also, please give feedback. Uh, this is the first time I'm giving this talk. I'm trying out some things for the first time, so I would like to know what worked and what didn't. And I think there is some time left now if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, you can have a longer break.